Okay, so today we are going to talk about elasticity and we will talk about elasticity both in terms of demand and in terms of uh, supply. But before we go on to the details, let us first understand why do we need to talk about elasticity and what is our takeaway uh, from this chapter. So, uh, last time we talked about the law of demand which basically says that whenever the price of a commodity goes up, the quantity demanded, the quantity bought and sold that goes down from the buyer's perspective and whenever the price goes down then the quantity demanded goes up. So, there is an inverse relationship between price and quantity, uh, everything else in the market staying the same that is ceteris paribus. Now, if this is true, if price goes up and quantity demanded comes down, while price goes down and quantity demanded goes up, if the law of demand holds, then for any transaction, the revenue that is generated from any transaction should have two opposite forces working on it. What do I mean by that? Now, if we talk about the revenue that is generated to the seller from any transaction, that revenue is given by price times quantity, the unit price of the good times the units of the commodity that were sold. So, for example, if 10 pounds of apples were bought, then Q would be 10 pounds and if the price of each pound is 2 dollars, then the total revenue generated would be 2 times 10 that is 20 dollars. So, if in this relationship as price goes up, the quantity comes down and as price comes down, the quantity goes up. So, you can see that for any transaction, there are two opposite forces that work on the revenue from that transaction. So, if the price changes by 2 dollars, if the price goes up by 2 dollars, the quantity might come down by 5 units and if the price goes down by 3 dollars, then the quantity might go up by let us say 10 units. So, there are two opposing forces that works on the revenue that is generated from this transaction. So, as a result of these two opposing forces, we do not know exactly what would be the impact on revenue from a transaction because the increase in price might increase the revenue, but the decrease in quantity that is happening at the same time tries to pull the revenue down. The opposite is also true. When the price goes down, the decrease in price tries to take the revenue down but at the same time, there is also an increase in quantity, so that would try to push the revenue up. So, we do not know really what happens to the revenue whenever the transaction of a commodity takes place and there is a price change due, due to which there is a subsequent quantity change in the uh, com commodity that is purchased. So, in order to understand what is the impact on revenue, we need this concept of elasticity. We need to understand how does the quantity demanded or the quantity supplied respond to price changes in the market and that would tell us exactly how the revenue responds uh, to a transaction in the market. So, when we talk about elasticity, we are going to talk about uh, the price elasticity price elasticity and under price elasticity, we will talk about the price elasticity of demand. We will talk about the price elasticity of supply. Next, we will talk about income elasticity and then we will also talk about 
cross price elasticity. Now, from the context of this course, this is the one that would be most relevant for you because most of your questions and your numerical problems will be based on price elasticity of demand. However, you should conceptually know the others also. Now, what is elasticity? Elasticity basically is when you apply a force to something, whether how the force works on the object is elasticity. For example, I have this marker and I am kind of exerting force on the two sides, but the marker does not change in shape or it does not change in length, it just stays the way it is, which basically means that this marker, this object has no elasticity. Now, that is talking about the concept from a very physics point of view. If I had a rubber band and I stretched it, then it would be, I would say it is elastic because as I stretch it, if I apply that force, then the rubber band would expand, it would change in shape and as soon as I remove that force, it would come back to its own uh, shape, the normal shape. So, this is talking about elasticity from a very science, from a very physics point of view. That is, if you apply a force and an object changes, changes its shape, then it is elastic and if you remove the force, it comes back to its original shape. However, there might be some other objects which do not yield at all to that force and those are inelastic objects. But now, let us talk about this thing from a very social science, from an economics point of view. In economics, it is exactly the same concept. In this case, there is a force exerted in the market and that force is the force of price. So, whenever the price changes, that creates an impact on the quantity demanded from the buyer's perspective and the quantity supplied from the seller's perspective. Now, if the quantity demanded or the quantity supplied are super responsive to the price change, then we say that the demand or the supply are elastic. And if the quantity demanded or the quantity supplied are not at all responsive to the price change, then we just say that the demand or supply are inelastic. So, the force is the price change and how demand or supply reacts to that force in the market defines whether the demand or supply is elastic or inelastic. Elastic simply means it is responsive and inelastic simply means it is not responsive. So, now let us go a little bit more deeper into the concept and see what does that mean mathematically. So, mathematically when we are talking about price elasticity of demand, we are basically referring to the percentage change and in economics we always refer to change by the Greek letter delta which is a small triangle. So, price elasticity of demand is the percentage change in quantity demanded and I'm, I want to differentiate between quantity demanded and quantity supplied. So, that is why I am using this suffix d. So, it is the percentage change in quantity demanded divided by the percentage change in the price of the commodity. So, we are talking about the price of the commodity in question. So, this really is the own price of the commodity. So, that is my price elasticity of demand. It is the percentage change in quantity demanded divided by the percentage change in price of the commodity. Similarly, the price elasticity of supply is the percentage change in quantity supplied. So, now I am going to use the suffix s to denote quantity supplied divided by the percentage change in the price of the commodity. So, the price percentage change in own price. So, that is how you define the price elasticity of demand and the price elasticity of supply. Now, please note that if the numerator is larger than the denominator, that means if the percentage change in the quantity demanded is higher than the percentage change in price, that means the quantity demanded is more responsive than the price change itself. In that case, we would call the price elasticity of demand to be elastic. So, if the numerator that is the percentage change in quantity demanded is higher than the percentage change in price, then it is demand elastic. 
However, if the percentage change in quantity demanded is lower than the percentage change in price, then the demand is inelastic. And if the numerator and the denominator are exactly the same, that is if the percentage change in quantity demanded is exactly equal to the percentage change in price, it would mean that the demand is unit elastic. So that means we can say that percentage change in quantity demanded greater than percentage change in price and once again that is the own price would mean that demand is elastic. Percentage change in quantity demanded being lower than the percentage change in price would mean demand is inelastic and percentage change in quantity demanded being exactly equal to the percentage change in price would mean unit elastic. Now what does that mean numerically? Let us understand what, that the, what does that mean numerically. Now if I have a fraction and the numerator is larger than the denominator in that fraction, for example if I have something like let us say 4 by 3, so you can see 4 is greater than 3, then numerically it means that this value must be greater than 1, right. Similarly, if I had the numerator is lower than the denominator, that means if I have something like 3 by 4, the numerator is smaller and the denominator is bigger, then it means that numerically this fraction is less than 1. In this case, 3 fourths would be 0 0.75, so less than 1. And if the numerator and denominator are exactly the same, if you had something like 3 by 3, then all of us, we already know that numerically this would be equal to 1, right? So that is what it exactly means. So for demand, whenever it is elastic, when the price elasticity of demand is elastic, then you have a numerical value for elasticity greater than 1 and elasticity of demand is denoted by EP. The price elasticity of demand is denoted by EP. So EP is greater than 1 for elastic commodities, EP is less than 1 for inelastic commodities and EP is exactly equal to 1 for unit elastic commodities, where EP stands for the price elasticity of demand. Now whatever discussion we just did is also true if you look at the same thing from the seller's perspective. From the seller's perspective, it is called the price elasticity of supply. That means how the quantity supplied by the seller responds to a change in prices in the market. Same thing. If the numerator is greater than the denominator, it means that the quantity supplied is super responsive to the price. For a small change in the price, there is a bigger change in the quantity supplied. So that would mean that from the seller's perspective, the price elasticity of supply for the commodity is in the elastic range, it is greater than 1, right? Similarly, if the numerator is smaller than the denominator, then it would mean that the quantity supplied by the seller is not as responsive to the price change and if they are exactly equal it would mean that they are, it is unit elastic or the responsiveness of quantity supplied is exactly equal to the change in price. So let us write that down. Instead of D now we will have S because now we are looking at quantity supplied, the price elasticity of supply. but the interpretation remains the same and price elasticity of supply instead of being denoted as EP, it is denoted as ES. So it is denoted as ES. However, conceptually whether you look at price elasticity of demand or you look at price elasticity of supply, both exactly mean the same thing. Now, 
once we have understood what is price elasticity of demand and price elasticity of supply, let's go a little bit deeper. Let's study this a little bit deeper because I said that from the context of this class, we will concentrate more on price elasticity of demand. Let's say we have a demand curve. And the demand curve is our D curve. And we have some, let us use some numbers. And once again, I am cooking up these numbers, so you could really use any number. So, we have these points. Now, please note that when the price is $10, the quantity demanded for this commodity is 6 units. When the price is $20, that is the quantity demanded. When the price is $30, then this is the quantity demanded for the commodity. Now, let us say the price changes. Now, let us kind of denote the points. So, the coordinates of this point would be 0, 40. The coordinate of that would be 230, 420, 610 and finally, 80. Now, how do we find out on the demand curve, how do we find out the elasticity between two points? So, what I am trying to say is if the price changes from $10 to $20 and as a result the quantity changes from 6 units to 4 units, then how do we find out the elasticity of demand? that has happened, that has taken place, what is the elasticity of demand due to that price change. Uh, so, let us uh, kind of try to take a look at that. What do we do to find that out? I will wipe these out for a minute. So, we are saying that my initial price, my P1, let us say that is the initial price, P1 is $10. At price P1, the quantity demanded is Q1. So, that is 6 units. When the price changes to P2, that is $20, the price has gone up. The quantity demanded changes to 4 units, right. So, for a $10 increase in price, I have a 2 units decrease in the quantity demanded. Now, these are absolute numbers, $10 and 2 units, these are not comparable because they are in different scale. So, I need to find something which is, which is unit less to tell me what is the elasticity. I, I have to find something which is independent of the scale of measurement. So, to find something which is independent of the scale of measurement, which is not based on the units of measurement, I will try to find the elasticity, the demand elasticity between these two price points and quantity points. And to do that, I use a formula which is called a midpoint formula. So, the midpoint formula is basically a formula for finding the elasticity of demand between any two price points and any two quantity points corresponding to those prices. So, you cannot just use any two arbitrary prices or any two arbitrary quantities. It has to be two price points and the corresponding quantity demanded points, right. So, in the midpoint formula, the general formula is Q2 minus Q1 divided by Q1 plus q2 by 2 
that whole thing divided by P2 minus P1 divided by P1 plus P2 by 2. Please note if you take a look at that formula then what we are trying to do here is basically trying to find the percentage change in quantity and dividing it by the percentage change in price. So basically this takes you back to that original formula where we are trying to find the percentage change in quantity and dividing it by the percentage change in price. We are trying to find a ratio between the two. So midpoint formula is not anything different from the original formula that we started from but it just uh, gives you that same formula in terms of two price points and the two corresponding quantity demanded points. Now with respect to our example if we just fill in those numbers, if we just replace those numbers Q2 was 4, Q1 was 6, okay, then P2 is 20, P1 was 10, and if I simplify that out, negative 2 divided by 5, the whole thing 10 divided by 15, that would be a negative 2 by 5 times a 15 by 10 which would be a negative 3 by 5, I think I am correct, yeah. So we end up getting an elasticity of demand between those two points as a negative 3, point, 3 by 5. Now when we talk about elasticity of demand, the sign does not matter it is only the magnitude that matters because what we are really interested in is the percentage change in quantity and the percentage change in price. We are not really worried about the direction of the change. This negative sign, this negative sign just tells me that whenever the price goes up, the quantity demanded goes down. So they are in opposite direction. So the purpose of that negative sign is just giving you the direction of the relationship whether it is inverse or direct that is only uh, the purpose of the negative sign. So here the negative sign does not give us any additional information what we are really interested in is the magnitude or uh, the absolute value. So basically the midpoint formula I could put two braces in there and those braces would mean that I am really interested in the absolute value. So the absolute value matters, the sign does not matter. So when I get negative 3 by 5, I just take the mod value or the absolute value which is 3 by 5. Those braces there mean mod numerically. So it means that I am just taking the absolute value that is 3 by 5. And as you can see, 3 by 5 is numerically less than 1 which means that for this commodity between those two price points the demand, the price elasticity of demand is demand inelastic because it is less than 1 and intuitively that is also true because you can see that the percentage change in quantity demanded is less than the actual percentage change in price. So also intuitively it should be demand inelastic. So that is how you calculate it numerically. If numerically this value was greater than 1 then I would call it demand elastic. If numerically this value was equal to 1 then I would call it unit elastic. 
Now let us go back to our demand curve diagram. Let us draw the demand curve one more time. Now, let me take two, four price points. So, I am taking four price points P1, P2, P3, P4. Let me call this point A. Point A is basically the midpoint of the demand curve. And corresponding to the four price points, let me take four quantity points. which is Q4, Q3, Q2 and Q1. Now, as you can visibly see that this distances, the distance between P3 and P4 are visibly the same as the distance between P1 and P2, right? So, if I consider a change of price from P3 to P4, and a change of price from P1 to P2, then as a layman without knowing anything about the concept of elasticity, I might think that since the price change is the same, the quantity demanded should also change by the same amount. However, in the figure that is not what you see. You can see in the figure that when the price increases from P3 to P4, the quantity demanded decreases from Q3 to Q4. So, that is the decrease Q3 to Q4 in that direction. And when the price goes up from P1 to P2, so these two distances are equal, the quantity decreases from Q1 to Q2, so that and once again in that direction. But you can visibly see that this quantity change is smaller than this quantity change. However, the price changes were equal. That means we can say that at two different zones on the demand curve, if you divide the demand curve into two different zones, then in this upper zone of the demand curve, for a price change, you have a bigger quantity change Whereas, in the lower zone of the demand curve, for the same price change, you have a much smaller change in the quantity demanded. So, we can say that the upper zone of the demand curve is price elastic, whereas the lower zone of the demand curve is price inelastic. And please note, this is the same demand curve. We are not talking about a different demand curve altogether. But as the slope of the demand curve, as we are going down the slope of the demand curve, as we are moving from the upper parts of the demand curve to the lower parts of the demand curve, you can see that the elasticity is changing. For the same change in price, you are seeing a much higher change in the quantity, a much lower change in the quantity demanded as you go down the demand curve, right? So, the upper part of the demand curve is elastic and the lower part of the demand curve is inelastic and this midpoint is the point where it really switches and that point is also the unit elastic point. So, at this point the EP is equal to 1, any points above that point the EP is greater than 1 and at any points below the midpoint, the EP or the price elasticity of demand is less than 1. So, in the same demand curve, on a linear demand curve, the upper part, the parts that are higher than the midpoint are price elastic and the part that is lower than the midpoint is price inelastic. Now, let us go back to where we started, where we started talking about the revenue and we said that revenue is price times quantity 
and whenever there is a change in price, whether price is increasing or decreasing, there is also a change in quantity and the change in price and quantity are always in the inverse direction. So, for a price increase, there is a quantity decrease, for a price decrease, there is a quantity increase and hence, there are opposing forces that are working on this revenue. But now that we know about elasticity, can we safely say that when the goods are elastic, if the commodity is elastic, the price elasticity of demand for the commodity is elastic. In other words, EP, price elasticity of demand is greater than 1, then this change in quantity for the commodity must be greater than the change in price, right? Because that is what we just said the percentage change in quantity is greater than the percentage change in price, right? So, can we then say that if that is true, then for all such commodities who have a price elasticity of demand greater than 1 or all those commodities which are demand elastic, for those commodities an increase in price would be defeated by the corresponding decrease in quantity and hence the effect on revenue will be driven by the quantity because the quantity effect is stronger, right? So, can we say for all these commodities the quantity effect is stronger? So, the impact on revenue is driven by the quantity change. If quantity goes up, then revenue goes up. If quantity goes down, then revenue goes down, right? However, on the other side, on the flip side, if I had a commodity that was inelastic or the price elasticity of demand for the commodity EP was less than 1, if I had a commodity like that, then Intuitively, we know that for such commodities, the percentage change in quantity demanded would be less than the percentage change in price, that is what we exactly said, right? And for those commodities, the price effect would be stronger, that would be the dominant effect. So, if you knew that the commodity is price inelastic, then it, you would immediately know that for such commodities, the price effect is stronger. So, it is the price effect that actually drives the revenue or in other words, whatever happens to price, the same happens to revenue. If price has gone up, then revenue would go up. If price has gone down, then revenue would go down. So, that means the takeaway from here is that the impact on revenue really depends on the nature of the commodity, whether the commodity is elastic or inelastic. That is what really tells you what is the impact on revenue and not really what has happened to price or quantity, right? So, for all elastic commodities, it is the quantity impact that drives the revenue or the quantity effect that drives the revenue. For all price inelastic commodities, it is the price impact or the price effect that drives the revenue, okay? So, that is our takeaway from here. So, next let us talk about how do we know whether a commodity is elastic or not? Of course, we have one option that is to numerically kind of study, look at the price points in the market, look at the quantity demanded points in the market and kind of numerically calculate what is EP. But other than that, can we really theoretically look at the commodity and say that, okay, this is price elastic and that is not? Right? So, that means what we are heading towards is we are basically going to talk about the determinants of elasticity. Determinants of price elasticity of demand. Now, the determinants of price elasticity of demand, the first one is availability of closed substitutes.
So, if you have a commodity that has several closed substitutes or closed alternatives available, then those commodities tend to be price elastic because think about a commodity. For example, think about ice cream. Ice cream has lot of closed substitutes available, right? You can get frozen custard, you can get frozen uh, uh, yogurt or even within ice cream, you can get different flavors, you can get a bar or you can get a cup or you can get a sundae and stuff like that, right? So, it has lot of closed substitutes available. For in those kind of commodity, if the price of one particular kind changes, then immediately people do not have that and instead have something which is a cheaper alternative, right? So, the demand easily shifts to an alternative if the alternatives are easily available. So, even if for a, if the price change is small, the change in quantity demanded might be larger because people have so many more other alternatives to shift to. So, that means for a commodity that has a large number of substitutes or large number of alternatives available tend to be more price elastic than other commodities for which alternatives are not available. For example, think about salt, right? Is there an alternative for salt? Not really. So, even if the price of salt changes, the quantity demanded for salt would not change as much because people have no alternatives available for salt. They have to add salt in their food. The next, next one is the nature of the commodity. The nature of the commodity that is a necessity the necessity versus a luxury good. A necessity versus a luxury good. For example, necessity for United States, gas is a necessity. You have to put gas in your car and you have to drive somewhere because cars, driving cars is the most common means of communication in United States. Or once again, the same thing like salt. Salt is a necessity. However, if you think of a diamond necklace, not everyone owns a diamond necklace. It's not an absolute necessity. It's a luxury commodity. If you buy one, then it's a luxurious product for you, right? So, for goods which are necessities, you have to buy them no matter what is the change in price. Even for a large change in price, the quantity demanded does not change as much because people have to own it, people you have to use it. So, the price elasticity for necessity goods tend to be low. In other words, those goods tend to be price inelastic, example being salt, gas, so on and so forth. However, for luxurious commodities, even for a small change in price, people choose not to buy them. Right? So, for a small price change, there is a larger change in quantity demanded. So, the luxury commodities tend to be price elastic, whereas the necessity commodities tend to be price inelastic. The third determinant of elasticity is the proportion of income spent. proportion of income spent. So, what proportion of income are you spending on the commodity that also tells you how responsive you should be to any price change in the commodity, right? For example, if you live in a rented house, the rent is a significant portion of your monthly income. So, even if there is a small change in the rent, then you most likely, you look for other alternatives, you look to move out because you are much responsive to that small par price change because that rent is a big portion of your monthly income. However, if there is a price change in something like, let's say, uh, what could be a small thing? If there is a price change in maybe bread, so how much bread you buy during a month is probably a very small portion of your income. Maybe you buy a bread or a loaf of bread every week. So possibly you spend around $10 every month on buying bread. And that's a very insignificant small portion of your income. 
So, for commodities like that which acquire a smaller proportion of your monthly budget or your monthly income, you tend to be unresponsive or inelastic to the price changes in those commodities. So, in other words, if a commodity acquires a larger proportion of your income, then you are price elastic towards those commodities, your demand is price elastic. However, if the commodities acquire a smaller proportion of your income, then you tend to be demand inelastic towards those commodities. And the last and final one, very important still, the time horizon. The time horizon, the short run versus the long run. So, if you think about elasticity and this is true both for demand and supply, this is true from the buyer's perspective as well as from the seller's perspective. Whenever a price change takes place, it takes time for consumers and it takes time for the producers to adjust their demand or supply in response to the price change. So, you do not see an immediate impact on the quantity demanded or an immediate impact on the quantity supplied whenever the price changes. So, in the short run, the price elasticity of demand or the price elasticity of supply tends to be inelastic. However, as time goes by, both consumers and producers have more time to adjust their quantity demanded or their quantity supplied and over a time horizon, the demand or supply becomes more price elastic. Right? Because let us say a price has gone up, right? your rent has gone up. So, in the short run, it is difficult for you to find a rented accommodation immediately. So, maybe you keep staying in that same house. right? So, your demand is inelastic, but over time you start looking for other houses and then you find a cheaper alternative, you find a cheaper substitute and you move into a different house which is cheaper. So, then your demand actually becomes more elastic. So, demand or supply from the buyer's perspective or the seller's perspective needs time for adjustment and that is why the time horizon is an important determinant of the elasticity of demand or supply. This is true from both perspective, demand perspective as uh, supply perspective. In the short run, the elasticity is lower. In the long run, the elasticity is higher. In the short run, the price elasticity of demand or supply for most commodities tend to be inelastic, but over time, they tend to become more elastic.